Next on Garden Line, the Tut Hill Park Ornamental Garden. Preparing to preserve the garden harvest. We're going to start adding the vegetables to that jar. Today I'm using carrots. And the proper method for pressure canning. This program is funded in part by Swiftel Communications. Welcome to Garden Line. I'm Tammy Watson. Tonight on our show, we'll get out of the garden and go into the kitchen. You'll hear from an expert extension person sorry, <laughs> who will demonstrate how to use a pressure canner to safely preserve your booming garden harvest. And in our Garden of the Week feature, we will take you to Tut Hill Park Garden in Sioux Falls, South Dakota to see the ornamental plants decorating this popular outdoor wedding location. And as always, our panel of lawn and garden experts will answer your questions, so get ready to call in. Our panelists are here with the most up-to-date information about gardening, lawn care, weed control, and all your other lawn and garden concerns. Joining me in the studio, ready to answer your questions, are John Keekeffer, Brookings County Extension Educator. Hello again. Steve Monk, Minnehaha County Extension Educator. Hello. Mike Mechnig, Extension Weed Specialist. Nice to be here, Tammy. And Casey Jensen, SDSU Wildlife and Fisheries Sciences Professor. Hi. The phone number for you to call in with your lawn and garden questions is 1-866-595-SDSU. Again, that's 1-866-595-7378. Helping answer the phones tonight are the Friends of Garden Line. Now remember, when calling in with your question, please provide our phone volunteers with as much information as possible about your garden problem. Be ready to tell us when the problem first appeared, if any surrounding plants have been affected, and similar details. Now before we get to your questions, we want you to understand it's not too early to start planning for your harvest. And with that in mind, we're going to take you to the Faye Tyler Wade Food Laboratory at South Dakota State University, where Extension Family Consumer Science Educator Sandra Namkin has some tips on the basics of in canning. We'll begin with our lesson in canning with how to get the vegetables, jars, and lids ready. Hi, I'm Sandra Namkin, Hamlin County Extension Educator, and I am on campus of SDSU today in the Faye Tyler Wade Foods Lab, and I'm going to be teaching you about doing some pressure canning. Canning can be a successful way of preserving those uh, garden vegetables for later use. Most of the garden vegetables that we're growing are low acid foods which have a pH of 4.6 or higher, so we need to make sure that we use the pressure canner to um, safely preserve those foods. There is a chance of there being botulinum spores in the foods and with the pressure canner we can kill them by reaching that uh, temperature of 240 degrees or higher. First of all you need to use a standard jar which is a mason jar. It's uh, heavier tempered glass and it's less likely to break in the pressure canner. We also want to check the jars to make sure there are no nicks or cracks on the top rim of that jar. We have our jars hot and um, we're going to start adding the vegetables to that jar. Today I'm using carrots and we need to allow for about an inch to an inch and a half of head space in that jar so that there's room for those foods to expand during that um, canning process. So that inch is about to the bottom or of the uh, lower rim there. Then we are going to add boiling water to the level of head space. And then you can take a plastic um, handle or wooden handle um, and just go around the jar to remove any air bubbles. 
You don't want to use a metal uh, knife or anything metal because that can weaken the glass and can cause breakage. Sometimes after you've done this, you may even need to add a little bit of water if the water is not covering um, the tops of the vegetables. Now we're going to wipe the top rim of the jar to make sure that we don't have any food on that um, on top of that jar because that could prevent getting a good seal. We're going to add a hot lid and again some things have changed. They don't recommend uh, boiling that lid anymore, just having it in some hot water because that could over soften that um, canning sealant that's there. We're going to add the um, screw band to the jar and we are to just finger tighten that screw band. Over tightening of the screw band could cause the um, lids to buckle. So right now we are ready to add the jar of food to the canner. All right, we're going to dive in with kind of our Hot Topics Roundtable. We're going to start with John Kiekeffer. What do you want to tell us about this week? I brought a little different insect this week, one that probably we won't be quite as scared of if they get out and, <laughs> and run around. Uh, they're pretty sedate right now. I'll try to just kind of open it up here a little bit and maybe we can get a shot in there. These are uh, fireflies or lightning bugs. They're really common out there right now at this time of year. They're flying around. Um, they are something that shows up middle of the summer for a lot of the species. Most people don't seem to see them as they're sitting there like this. They see them when they're twinkling in the, the nighttime, kind of sparkling. And, uh, and so we sometimes mistake them for other things when you see them. But they are beetles. They're not actually flies or bugs. They're, they're beetles. As larvae, they're predatory on mm, earthworms and other ground-dwelling insects and things. As adults, most of them are predatory as well. and Kind of neat, really, in the way that they feed on other things because they have a, a unique mandible system where they actually have a it's like a fang with a pore that runs through the center of it, and they inject their prey with a venom oh, wow. and let it die, <laughs> much like a rattlesnake would, and, and uh, then track it down. Well, they're kind of pretty because on the back side they've got a little bit of orange back here, and then on the underside you can see the kind of yellow or the area that lights up. So, right, that's, yeah, that's that underside is is what gets a lot of attention from it. Not all the species have that; most of the big ones around here do. And, that's what people think of when they when they see fireflies. All right, thank you. Steve Monk, what do you have for us this week? Well, Tammy, this is the time of the year that, well, basically in every garden, there's tomatoes, and then we usually go beyond that as far as other vegetables. But <laughs> it's the time of the year that we start looking at our tomatoes and help prevent them as far as getting some of the typical blights, either septorial leaf spot or early blight or late blight. And we have a couple pictures to show some of these uh, on the screen that we'll talk about. And the one thing we really want to emphasize here is to do some cultural control or preventive measures if at all possible. Stake the tomatoes, get them up, prune them if need be, space them out uh, when you're planting them earlier if you did not already, uh, so that good air movement it goes between those plants, keeping them dry. If you are watering those plants, try to drip irrigate or subsurface the, the irrigation of those and do not water overhead if you can help uh, prevent that. The second slide here, the septorial leaf spot was one we just showed and this is uh, early blight on this particular one here that we're showing. But all three of these diseases really can be prevented in the same types of, of preventative measures. Uh, we, I started talking about watering. You can water overhead but if you do, do that during the morning time so that the plants can dry off during the day. And the next picture we show is that Pretty much all these diseases are started at the bottom of the plant is where you'll notice that because they're splashed up onto the lower leaves and with the moisture conditions we have, especially heavy dew conditions, that's where it sets in. So some preventive measures, we talked about watering, as well as using mulches or any kind of a barrier to help prevent that soil being splashed up onto those lower leaves and maybe even pruning off some of those lower leaves uh, of those plants. And that'll help prevent that uh, or at least slow down the symptoms of those getting onto the plants, the inoculants. Uh, if it does have that and you want to go a chemical control, which is kind of our last resort and recommendation, there's uh, some chemicals you can use or vegetable disease preventers, and you want to look for the ones that have early blight, late blight, or septoria leaf spot listed on the label for diseases to be controlled. Most commonly right now, probably the, the active ingredient will be chlorothalonil, and follow all label directions associated with that. Okay, that sounds complicated. I'm gonna I'm gonna take your advice on the mulch and the pruning. How much do I go ahead and snip off if I? So have you problems? get the leaves up off the ground so they're not touching the ground if at all possible. 
and that mulch or that plastic barrier or anything that you can do to help prevent rain or uh, irrigation water from splashing the soil up under those lower leaves will help delay that, that issue or that problem. Rotation of crops within the garden spot as well. Okay, that's some good advice, thanks. I've had that problem, so. Yeah. Mike, <laughs> what do you have for us today? Sure, well, you know, the stinging insects and bugs have been giving a, getting a lot of people's attention, but there's also a lot of stinging weeds out there that we need to be looking mm. for, especially as we go out camping and enjoying the outdoors in the summer. I want to kind of watch the ground as well as the sky. Uh, one common weed that we see around, uh, especially near lakes and that sort of area, is poison ivy. Uh, not a lot, you know, sometimes people misidentify this one. It grows as kind of a vine. It can grow in the grass. It can grow up trees, that sort of thing. Uh, but it can be found right out in the open. But, you know, they always say those leaves of three, let it be. And that's a good way to identify poison ivy. Particularly look at that middle leaf, how it's kind of extended out on that petiole. Uh, stretch out a little bit longer than the other two leaves. So watch for three leaves. Sometimes you'll see some jagged edges on the margins, but uh, watch out for the poison ivy. Now, another weed that you might see that's often mistaken for poison ivy is woodbine or uh, uh, Virginia creeper. Now this one is not a stinging plant. It's perfectly fine. You can touch this or do whatever you want. It doesn't harm anything, but people often mistake this for poison ivy. I was with people this weekend who are walking through their poison ivy to avoid this plant. So don't do that, you know, <laughs> this one is perfectly fine. It can be confused with poison ivy, but notice the five leaflets. Uh, next weed we have uh, on the list of stinging weeds to look for is a uh, wood nettle. Uh, this is, you know, maybe a lesser known nettle, but uh, you might find this in wooded areas with the typical jagged uh, leaf margins, uh, which can cause some moderate stinging. And we may have even one more picture of the common stinging nettle, possibly. Uh, here we go, and this is, a, this is one you might see out in the open areas, maybe along the edges of wood, wooded areas, that sort of thing. Uh, but notice that it has those little hairs uh, on the stem. Those hairs are filled with a cocktail of chemicals that once it gets on your skin, causes an itchy reaction. So nettles, that sort of thing. Um, poison ivy, lots of weeds to kind of be looking for out there to avoid uh, as you're enjoying the outdoors this summer. A quick question for you. When I was a kid running around in the grove, we always talked about itch weed. Is there such a weed as itch weed or is, was it probably stinging nettle? It could have been stinging nettle, it's hard to say. Um, okay, that's you know, a not a real technical cause. term. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just checking. Stinging nettle would be my, my best guess. Thanks. Casey, what do you have for us this week? Well, um, coming into the middle of the summer now, uh, for those of you that have birds around your house or are trying to attract them, um, don't be alarmed at this time of the year if you start seeing numbers of birds kind of slacking off at your feeders. Uh, what's happening right now is the birds have young in the nest and during this time of the year, uh, they're trying to feed them mostly insects and things that are high in protein so they may may not come to your feeders as often and that's okay and so this might be a time if you're looking at backing off feeding or if you have three feeders and you want to cut back to one this would be a good time to do that also right now uh, is a, is really important if you've got uh, a watering station uh, in your yard to keep that full and clean I would suggest cleaning it every day uh, the birds are going to use it really heavily uh, a, good, a good source of clean water is a, always a really good way to attract birds to your yard and, and where you can see them, and it's good for them as well. Okay, thanks. Those are some good tips, guys. All right, earlier Garden Line paid a visit to the <coughs> Tut Hill Park Garden in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. It's a popular outdoor wedding location that boasts charming floral beauty. Our camera looked closely at the ornamental plants decorating the garden around the gazebo, and here's a snapshot of that outdoor decor.
okay. We're glad you're here, and we're going to dive into the questions. A question from Mission about irises. There are spots all over the leaves from the start to the growth, since it's been starting to grow. Is this a fungus? Uh, if so, can they dig them up, uh, treat the dirt? What, uh, what would you do with irises that have spots all over the leaves? Well, probably the best thing they can do there is actually bring a sample into the extension office to verify that it is perhaps a leaf spot disease that is on the, on the irises. Um, that would be the most common one that they would have. As far as digging those up or treating the soil, that would not be recommended at this time as far as any type of soil treatment. It's more of the plant related that if they are going to do any treatment, in some cases they may even want to look for a new plant to put in there uh, once it has some of that leaf spot if that's what it has. But actually to bring that in and have that verified would be the best thing to do to send a sample in. Okay. Yep. Um, all right. A uh, question from Canova with grapevines. When can you prune the dead vines from grapes? Well, if they're dead vines, you can prune those anytime because they're not providing anything to the plant at all. So if it is actually dead, not providing any nutrients, no leaves or anything on that, that can come off anytime. Okay, uh, so they yep. can just get the pruners out. And That's just... correct. Yeah, whether grapes or trees or anything, if it's a dead branch, take it off. That oh. can come off anytime. I love the answers like that. Just do you, do you right recommend there. cutting up into the dead tissue a little bit more or how, is there, does it matter? Typically what we would recommend on that is to go back to the next joint to where it looks like there is live tissue uh, because at that joint area or that collar that'll have tissue that'll help scar over that wound and mm. seal it off for other secondary problems that could get in if they leave a stub. So uh, prune it back to the next joint and that's where you'd make your cut. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, a question from Brandon. Earwigs, where do they come from? What damage do they cause? How long are they going to be around and how do you get rid of them? just about everything about earwigs, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, as far as where they come from, uh, kind of a long answer and a short answer on that one. The species that we're dealing with primarily here right now is an introduced species. So part of the reason that people think they see them now and they haven't seen them 10 years ago, 20 years ago, is exactly that. They're moving into this area. They are uh, breeding here. They're successful at breeding and overwintering here. And so they're really coming from here. They're not coming in from somewhere else. They're just surviving our seasons here and, and successful at living here, really, at this point. They're really favored by the cooler, moist weather, especially that moist weather. And where we tend to find them in yards and places is up around foundations, places where there's some shelter in there where they can get in there, maybe crawl under some mulch and hide and things like that. So to get rid of them, try removing those hiding places first. Open that up, get a little more sun in there if you can. Clean out some of that mulch maybe. Just uh, take away some of the places where they'll hide. Beyond that, up around gardens and things, you want to look at uh, maybe a, a systemic or uh, residual type chemical, something that'll last a little while because they are very mobile and even if you kill the ones that are there now, you could end up with your neighbors moving in. What, can you toss out a few chemical names or uh, some products that I'd know what I was looking for? Right. Um, you know, any of the general garden type chemicals, if you okay. look for, especially some of the pyrethroids, will have some actions that will either. So read the label and it'll plant. have right. earwigs on there? Yep, most of them will list earwigs on there. Do they feed on plant, live plant material or dead plant material? A little bit of both on that. Oh. They're going to feed on some of the live plant material. If there isn't much dead plant material, they will switch over to dead plant material. Some species are pretty active predators and will finish off other insects, including the European earwigs that we have here right now. If there's not much else around, they'll switch over to eating other insects and do quite well on those. Okay. Um, somebody had emailed in, well, somebody, a viewer from Beersford actually, had emailed in a photo, and uh, we've got that for you right now. They say, last summer I cut down some dead trees in my grove, and in its place uh, these plants grew where there's now sunlight, they stand about seven feet tall, they have orange fruit. Could you tell me what these are? And as again, that's from Beersford. Mm -hmm. After looking at that picture, probably our, our best guesstimate on that would be a, uh, a honeysuckle uh, that was perhaps there either as a small plant, uh, being hindered or held back by the shade by the taller trees. And once they were removed, the sun uh, gave it a little more energy to activate it, or even perhaps it could be from uh, seed that was there, but they said it was seven feet tall or been there for a while? Um, yeah, they stand about seven feet tall yeah. and 
um, where there's sunlight. Okay, and we don't know how long ago they removed those trees, but from the picture, that would be uh, my suggestion or answer would be that, that it's honeysuckle, so. Okay. And honeysuckle can be kind of an invasive brush species, especially you go further east in Minnesota and Wisconsin. It's, it's, it is an ornamental, but it can also escape yeah. and, and invade wooded areas. Yeah. It's, not, it's not a real common plant now because of the, um, the aphid that would get into the honeysuckles and cause witch's brooming on the end. And uh, either which unless you did, what, what's that? What it does, it creates abnormal growth. So you get, uh, like on the end, it almost looks like a broom where all the leaves and the stems are kind of bunched together uh, on the end. And not a, is usually quite unsightly and would, would die back uh, the following year. And um, in most cases, to really control that, you'd have to do a regular spray program, mm. which is more than a number of homeowners wanted to do. And yeah. so they just, uh, the mm. popularity of honeysuckle has really dropped off. So it's kind of an unusual plant now because of that, but um, that would be uh, probably what he has there. Okay. Um, another email question from Huron. The flying gnats of some sort have been a real troublesome thing this spring and summer in the Huron area probably due to all the rain the last couple of months. Um, the only reference to the gnat problem on Garden Line was about six weeks ago when John Ball answered uh, someone's question and said they would probably disappear in three weeks, but it's rained a lot since then. Um, so in six to eight weeks, they're still here, worse than ever. Um, in, a, in addition to get, getting rid of the excess water along the James River and elsewhere, um, how might they be able to take care of these? They've heard home remedies like vanilla products with deep cologne, um, sprayed the lawn with chemicals, cutter, malthion, but none seem to work on the gnats, even though they do a good job controlling mosquitoes. Right, and that's exactly what they're gonna find with, with those things. The, the repellents that they were talking about there, the DEET, the vanilla, um, things like that, I, my understanding is that vanilla works better than some of the commercial uh, repellents, personal repellents on it. DEET is not all that effective against them. Will help a little bit, but it's not going to be a real long-lasting thing or, or re reduce numbers the way that we would see with mosquitoes. For the uh, chemical control in lawns and things like that, I think our viewers here are finding exactly what the problem is with trying to recommend anything on that. There just isn't much that's going to do a whole lot. You can spray for them. They're far more active, more mobile than mosquitoes are. They're not likely to rest in the vegetation a lot. They're going to keep moving around. If they are resting in vegetation, they're going to sit up higher in trees and things like that. It's just going to be very, very difficult to try to get rid of them in a case like that. And, and so you can keep spraying, I guess, but chances are you're still going to have plenty of them around, so it's best to just wait them out if you can. What about all of a sudden I feed a certain kind of bird and the birds come eat them? I'm dreaming. That's not going to work. Well, well, no. I mean, aerial insectivores will, will eat them. Now, they're more active in the evening hours. and So things like nighthawks in particular, uh, which nest on flat gravel roofs, uh, will eat a lot of them. But the, the, probably their biggest aerial predator will be bats. And so you could erect bat houses and... Um, and, and they'll take some. I can't say they're going to get rid of your problem because uh, there's just so many of them out there, but, but they will take their share. Is there a way to promote bats coming to my property and do I want them coming to my oh, property? Oh, sure. Uh, people, there's, there's all kinds of instructions on building bat houses. Uh, bat Conservation International probably is the best uh, clearinghouse for that information. I think it's bci.org is the, the website. But they've got all kinds of uh, plans for bat houses for different kinds of bats. And what, the nice thing about a bat house is you can build a, a fairly modest one, uh, say 12 inches wide and 18 inches tall and maybe 8 or 10 inches deep, and it might hold 400 bats. Whoa! <laughs> um, and so you can, you can get in, you can get a lot of bats on your property in a hurry uh, with, with bat houses. Now, uh, it you know, I've heard bats can carry disease, is that? They can, as can just about any living thing, you know. The problem with bats is we worry about rabies yeah. uh, because they can get into homes and, and they, they, you know, they can carry rabies. However, the beneficial aspects of, of having bats around, I think, you need to weigh that. Uh, my personal preference is I'd rather have the bats Okay. around eating the bugs. It's yeah. something that we end up actually recommending quite a bit. If people have bats in their houses, we tell them to go ahead and put up a bat house and hopefully 
they'll move into that and leave right. the house alone. Oh, okay. Yeah. But regarding the vanilla spray, mm -hmm. I was doing some plot work on in Flandreau earlier this year and just getting hammered by the gnats. The locals recommended I go to Sturdivant's to get some vanilla bug spray, and I thought, well, that's an automotive store. Why would they yeah. have bug spray? Uh, it turns out, so I went there and I asked, and it turns out they had a, it's a vanilla interior car air freshener type thing. <laughs> I thought that was weird, uh, and I, they were <laughs> good enough to give me one of the last bottles in town, which was very nice. And I took that, sprayed that on my clothes and on my hat and that sort of thing, and boy, it worked well. Oh, so wow. the vanilla... Now, I don't know if that would be so good for your skin, but uh, it, yeah, it, it, it was you potent. Know, <laughs> I'm not sure. I've, I've heard people talk about getting the concentrate for making candles, the vanilla yeah. scented candles, yeah. and using that. I've heard of people even, I guess maybe in desperation, I'm not sure, taking the vanilla scented candles and rubbing themselves with the candles <laughs> to try to keep them off. I'm, so it, mu it must do something. I well, think. it sure worked well for me. So I'm thinking there might be some difference between essential oil and extract. Going, what, yeah. what I can consume. Got to be careful and grabbing any chemical off the shelf and spraying it all huh. over, of course. Well. But uh, maybe if you can just keep it on your clothes, maybe it won't be so bad. Yeah, yeah. I guess if our viewers have had experience using vanilla car spray to <laughs> keep the gnats at bay, we'd like to hear from you. Um, lilacs. Uh, this is from Fairfax. A few lilac plants in our hedges have wilted and turned brown. I pruned the dead ones, but noticed that a couple more are wilting. They were planted five years ago, bloomed nicely this spring. A very large lilac bush in another part of the yard is also affected. We were very wet this spring, as well as uh, if that would have any bearing on this problem, any help would be appreciated. They don't want to lose their lilacs. Uh, and that could be one where it could be actually a, a number of different problems. Uh, the first thing to do would be to check around the base of that plant to make sure the bark is good and okay and was not chewed up or chewed off or damaged during the winter time because that would allow them uh, even in the spring for the, the leaf growth to come out until the food reserves are used up and then it may br turn brown and dry up. Uh, there is also that possibility, uh, five years isn't too long, uh, but potential uh, lilac bore going up through the center of that vine as well and uh, that's something I'll John right. Talk about. Right, and that's that would be my first thought on that is if you'd maybe cut a few of those off and see if you've got some fairly large boreholes through them, it's mm -hmm. possible that you have a larvae of a clear wing moth actually that would be tunneling through there and, and causing some of that loss. What do you do? Uh, get a new plant or what? Well, they prefer that older, larger wood. So if you simply cut back some of those older ones and let them regenerate. A lot of times for lilacs, that'll pretty well take care of the, the problem. Lilacs can take hard pruning, right? Is that or They can, I? and as we, well, the question we had earlier, if it's turned brown, uh, really providing nothing to that plant as far as live tissue, that can be taken off. And when we say taken off, probably three, four inches just above the ground, they could cut that off. And that's probably the best way really to control those is right. to do kind of re rejuvenational pruning on a regular basis, taking out that larger wood, and that'll help uh, prevent some of that borer problems. Okay. Is there a time of year that is best to address that, just now you, when the problem if is? If you're just going to take out the large wood, you can do that either spring or fall. Uh, if you wanted to do some light pruning and maintain it so you're going to have flowers again next year, then you would do some light pruning after the flowers of this year uh, have, have dried up and kind of wilted because they'll be setting the flower buds at that time for next year. So if you prune this fall, you're, it won't hurt your plant, you just won't have any flowers next spring. So you got to kind of gauge what is it that you're really after. But if you're after really trying to control the, the, the borer, uh, taking out that large wood, that could be done this fall or next spring, either, either way. Okay, great. A uh, question from Coleman about Canadian thistle. There are three round balls on the thistle stem. Looks like cherry tomato clusters, and these, these thistles are out in the pasture. What are these clusters? Are they poisonous, and how do you treat? Uh, clusters on the stem, well, it, it could be in luck. This could be the bile control insect that was released uh, in South Dakota uh, called the gall fly, or that's commonly called the gall fly. Um, it's, uh, you know, like I say, it was, it's released uh, for the purpose of, of, you know, partially controlling Canada thistle. Really, all it ends up doing is kind of inhibiting the flower growth and inhibiting seed production, that sort of thing. Uh, so it doesn't do a whole lot to control it, but maybe it suppresses it a little bit. So, um, you know, and eventually the, when the plant turns brown, you know, if, if you cut that gall in half and look inside, you might see some little larva uh, living in there. But, you know, you don't want to do that. want to let them live and be happy and, um, 
and you know it, it's, it's a good thing so okay go ahead and now but like I say it doesn't control the thistle so if you do have a big patch or whatever you might still want to go and, mm -hmm. and control it with mowing or herbicide something else but uh, because it, that won't do it but okay. uh, it is a good thing to go apply okay um question from elkton and i think you answered this earlier tomato bottom leaves are getting yellow with small brown spots what can he do yeah really the best thing there is if the symptoms are already starting to show up is remove those those particular leaves um, and minimize any kind of overhead watering with all the rains we're having you really have no option again uh, to for that to, to control that um, but put down some mulch if you can to help maybe minimize the soil splashing up on any of the other leaves and probably consider some chemical to control at this point but also if it's already starting uh, those plants may be cut short a little bit for this season as far as going all the way to maturity but get what you can off of that plant and uh, it's probably the best thing they can do at this point. Okay. Yeah. All right, up next, we're going to go back to the Faye Tyler Wade Food Laboratory at SDSU to finish our lesson in pre preserving garden produce. Here again is Extension Family Consumer Science educator Sandra Namkin with some important pressure cooker usage tips. First of all, you need to check the pet cock or vent of the canner to make sure that nothing is blocking it so just lift it up and look through it you should be able to see light through that okay now we are going to add the jar to the canner using the jar lifter and make sure you get that jar lifter under the rim of um, that glass so you get a good grip on that okay we're going to add the jar to the canner and I have hot water in that canner and with the pressure canner we only use about two inches of water in the bottom of the canner versus the boiling water bath canner which would have the foods the jars would be totally covered and the boiling water would go about an inch above the top of the canner now as we put the lid on we lock that in place okay now that we place the lid on the canner we are going to exhaust the canner and we need to do that for about 10 minutes we'll turn up the heat and make sure that that water gets to boiling in there and then we'll have a good amount of steam coming out of that um, steam vent Okay, now that we have exhausted the canner for 10 minutes, we should have the oxygen out of it and we are going to add the weight to that valve. And now the pressure will start building up on the dial gauge. We want to get to 11 pounds pressure because of the altitude that we have here is about 14 to 1600 feet in Brookings. And for our pint of carrots, we are going to Keep that pressure maintained at 11 pounds pressure for 25 minutes. Now that we have reached the 11 pounds pressure, we want to turn down the heat so that we can maintain that pressure at 11 pounds for 25 minutes. With the gas range, the temperature change is more immediate than it is with the coil burner. So you maybe want to go to um, a medium setting or just kind of watch that and adjust it with that control on your stove. Once the pressure has dropped to zero, then we can remove the weight and then it's suggested that we wait another 10 minutes to just make sure that all that pressure has gone out of that canner. And when you remove the um, lid, you're going to unlock it by turning the lid and then tilting it so that the top is going away from you so that the steam will be away from your face. Remove the jar with the um, jar lifter and just place it on a towel in a draft-free place for that to um, cool down. And you should be hearing some popping noises, hopefully, that you've had some successful results in your canning. And then within uh, about 12 to 24 hours, you can check for good seals on those jars. Uh, label your jars as to the uh, month and year that those foods were canned. You can remove the screw bands and wipe off the rims of those jars and store those in a cool, dry place. back to our questions in our studio discussion and we're just commenting seems like there's a fair amount of insect questions tonight you said the the weather's warmed up and they're active 
Yeah, people see that damage and they're worried about what's going on with them. Well, this is a question to, to that end. It's from Redfield. Two weeks ago, we discovered a hole at the base of a Siouxland poplar tree, which was planted four years ago on the north side of our house amongst some stone pavers. The hole looks as if a drill bit had been inserted, leaving behind a small pile of wood shavings below the hole. We do not see any insects in the hole or around the tree. Also in the yard are two 20-year-old Siouxland poplars and a couple of seven-year-old quaking aspen trees that don't show any signs of the same problems. What kind of treatment might be needed? Well, this is kind of a, an interesting one. This is one of those, like, we get a lot of times with these sorts of things. I think they kind of, they didn't know it necessarily, but kind of hit upon the answer in the question. So it looked like a drill bit had been inserted, and that's kind of the key there. It's not a drill bit, but unfortunately the insects are gone. You know, they emerge from the wood, they drill their way out, that's when you see the hole. Before that, they're tunneling inside and you just, you don't even see them in there. So this is probably one of two insects. It's probably a poplar borer. Could also be a cottonwood borer, but more likely it is the, the poplar borer. Um, these are large beetles. They're not necessarily so obvious. They you know, leave fairly quickly after they emerge. As far as not seeing them on the other trees, you know, it's possible the other trees aren't affected at all. It's also possible that they're in there and you just haven't seen anything yet. So a lot of times I think trees tend to get hit with these insects when they're a little bit stressed to begin with. You might want to check and see if the tree is suffering from something else at the same time, maybe short of water or has some other condition that would be stressing it a little bit. Otherwise, as far as treatment for them, we don't have a real great treatment for these type of insects in the trees. There are some, some ground drenches that may have some effect on them, but for the most part, there's not a lot you can do for them once they're in there. Is that hole into the tree, does that need to be filled or covered over, or is that? that not necessarily. Nope? It's, it's something that's there, and it's not going to do much. The tree will fill it in over time anyway, and other insects aren't likely to go into it through there unless the tree is dead inside already. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, question from Pierre. In the spring of 2007, I planted two forever and ever hydrangea. They're on the southeast corner of the house. They have never grown that much, and this year they are very small and beginning to flower, and the flowers are only the size of a zinnia. Some of the leaves have brown spots. I do use miracle Grow on them. Can anything be done to save them? What can I do to make them grow bigger? They're supposed to be 30 to 36 inches tall and wide. Mm. It sounds more like an environmental condition. It may not be a site that's favorable for that type of plant. They said the southeast. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it maybe gets a little too warm, too dry there perhaps. Uh, could be for that. Uh, the other option as well would be to do take a soil test to see where they're at nutrient-wise and even pH-wise because that will uh, affect those types of plants if the pH is, is off or not favorable for those plants. Uh, as far as flower development and even color of the flower uh, can be affected by that. So um, I would check the soil to start with. Uh, and if the soil comes back being okay for that type of plant to grow there, uh, then it may be making sure there's not too much sun or the heat of the day uh, may be affecting them. So okay. uh, I don't know if there's anything else. That anybody which else which shade? I mean, it sounds like our, that sounds like our uh, hydrangea plants, which are growing in a lot of shade. Yeah. They're not growing very well. Well, that could go either way. This one sounds like it could, in this particular case, did they say shade or full um, sun? Or? I don't see anything yeah. about sunlight okay. here. I, I, I guess I don't it, know. what I would look at is maybe a filtered uh, sunlight, especially if you could have a planting so that the latter part of the day where it gets warmer uh, and the hottest of the day that maybe a, a bush or a tree would start to shade it. Uh, whereas if it had shade most of the time, which may be your case, Mike, then that may be limiting it as far as too little sunlight coming in. Uh, they should have at least eight hours, six to eight hours of direct sunlight during the day. Okay. Uh, but it's that late afternoon, three to six o'clock, can get pretty warm in the southeast corners of houses. So. Now you recommend a soil test. How do they get that done? The best thing they can do there is just stop in their, their local county extension office and they will give them a sheet to fill out, an informational sheet, and then a soil sample bag to send the sample in. On the back of that sheet we'll talk about the uh, sampling procedure and technique and how to do that. Uh, and just take the samples around that plant, mix it together, send one representative sample in, six to eight inches down, and uh, they'll give it, and they'll test with the nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, pH, salts, and um, they used to do the organic matter, but for uh, most gardens now, unless you request it, uh, they don't do the organic matter, so. Hmm. Another thing I ought to do. Um, we've got another email question with an image 
uh, and this person is from Valley Springs. They sent in this photo. I have these small yellow flower cl clusters growing just this year in my lawn. What is it and how do you treat it? And uh, if the, the yellow flowers are pretty tiny there, but you can... I yep. think that's in my lawn too, I'm afraid. Yeah, a lot of people have this one and, and are seeing it now, now that it's flowering, becoming a little bit more obvious. Uh, this is black medic. Uh, it's just uh, a, an annual or a biennial species. So luckily it's not one of those tough perennials. Now, it, but it being an annual, it, will, uh, it spreads by seed and it will make a lot of seed. So uh, you'll see it there next year. Um, you know, maybe once it starts producing little tiny curly seed pods, you might want to maybe collect uh, the grass clippings, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, herbicides at this point, you know, it's, it's reaching the end of its life. Uh, so herbicides are going to be marginal. Um, you know, your general weed be gone, Trimex uh, might suppress it. Uh, there is a, a special herbicide for clovers that you might find in your hardware store called uh, Weed Be Gone for Clover, Chickweed, and Oxalis. That has a chemical called triclopyr in it. Uh, that might be the best thing to use. Uh, but again, it's, it's getting a little late now. You'd, you'd want to have used that maybe three weeks ago when the, when the plants were still pretty small. Um, you know, otherwise, sometimes you can hand weed those. Now, in your case, you look like you have a pretty dense infestation, but sometimes some people will notice it's just one plant that's really wide, and so you take that one plant out and you pretty much problem solved. And so sometimes hand weeding is actually an option there. Um, otherwise, uh, so yeah, that, that's really where we're at now. Next year, uh, maybe be watching for it and, and try to uh, try to maybe use a herbicide a little bit earlier, a general broadleaf herbicide like Weed Be Gone or Trimac. Okay, good good answer, thanks. Um, a question from Brookings, red-headed woodpeckers are eating holes in apple trees. What can be done to discourage them? Boy, <coughs> uh, that's that's one that's hard hard to get at. You're not to, very yeah, good at this? Um, or what? <laughs> well, um, no, you, you can put nets around the trees uh, to keep the birds out. Uh, it's, it's illegal to, to, to shoot migratory birds, and so that's not an option. Uh, so some people try different things, scarecrow kind of, of, of options. People will hang CD discs old CDs and they'll, they'll kind of glimmer and sparkle and, and I think that may work for a while but after a while the birds will get used to it and so you have to change those things up uh, now and then but uh, I've, I've got the same problem on my house the, the woodpeckers like to, like to hammer on my cedar siding and, uh, and so I've tried all kinds of things and to kind of varying degrees of success. Okay. Uh, John, would that indicate that they maybe should check for borers? Or? Possibly, yeah. They could yeah. be after some of those things. I, I guess I've even seen where the woodpeckers, the red-headed woodpeckers anyway, are going after the fruit directly mm -hmm. oh, and seem yeah. to be eating some of the fruit rather than yeah, digging Yeah, at certain times wood. of the year I think that's going to be more, more so than others. I've noticed the woodpeckers at my place right now, are they're actually coming in and getting seeds out of the, out of the feeders and so they're looking at they're looking for different dietary things because right now they're feeding young and young requires uh, food with a lot of protein in it and so and and other nutrients and so I think birds and wildlife in general get cravings kind of like people do and so just sometimes they feel like oh <laughs> you know today I'm going to eat apples. <laughs> you know. All right, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, just a couple of comments from viewers. Both of these are from Sioux Falls uh, about our conversation on gnats. One says, use real vanilla. And another said, absorbing junior behind the ears, elbow joints. Um, they use it while a, on a regular basis while golfing and it works well for them. So just uh, sharing, uh, sharing those ideas. Um, Oh, another bird question from Nanda. She has two Martin houses, houses, and she found some dead Martins this spring. Her son said there was no flying insects. Um, there were no flying insects this spring. What do you think happened to the Martins? Um, th that's exactly what happened. We had a, a really, really cold snap in early May, the second week of May. Uh, the the adult martins, the the uh, the mature ones, had already gotten here and gone back to their nesting houses, uh, and then there was a period of about four days where it got very cold and all the flying insects stopped flying. Uh, 
Uh, and I got phone calls from as far away as, as uh, Jamestown, North Dakota, all the way down to Sioux City, of people finding large numbers of Martins dead in their houses. And that's exactly what happened. And so the thing to do would be to clean those out. Now the, the, the good thing was the, the immatures or subadult birds migrate later. And so about 10 days to two weeks later, those subadults came in and mm -hmm. and they can they can breed just fine uh, and in in some years they don't because they don't compete well with the adults but this year uh, we're we're thankful we had them because they're the ones that are that are breeding in the martin houses now this year and okay. there's probably not much you can do to try to feed no, them as well nothing you happens. can do it's just one of those things that happens okay um we have a question from somebody that lives out in the country raccoons are eating my mulberries and leaving scat all over the yard. What do I do? That's kind of annoying, to say the least. Is it a health problem? Well, it can be. Uh, raccoons carry a, a, a worm, a, a parasite, oh. that can c cause terrible problems in children in particular if they ingest the feces. And so if you have, if you have raccoon droppings around your home, you need to be very careful. Clean that up. Uh, use rubber gloves. Wash your hands. Uh, this is a parasite. You really don't want to. You don't want to deal with. What's the name of it? Oh I'm sorry, my I didn't mean to put you on the spot. You know, yeah, I I think it's a meningeal worm, but I don't. I, I, I don't. I, I can't remember okay. exactly what it is. Rest assured, though, it is a parasite and it's a worm. It can cause problems. And so, if you do have raccoons around. And they're leaving droppings. You need to you need to take care of that. Now, what do you do there, boy? Other than trap the raccoons and get them out of there, that would be my 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 uh, my best recommendation. Uh, trap raccoons are suckers for kind of rotten peaches, mm, and so okay. it, that's the best bait I know is to use a kind of a rotten mushy peach and put it in the back of a live trap and they'll go in after it and then you can just yeah. remove the wreck. I've had good luck with eggs and sardines as yep. well if you're trying, yeah. to, mm. trying to trap But nothing them. really repels them as far as keeping them out of the area. No. 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 And, and mulberry, I mean, they're after the fruit and so other than take the mulberry tree out. Okay, that's the other right. kind of drastic option there right. for them. All right, uh, that's good to know that there's yeah. a real health, health potential problem there. Uh, Creeping Jenny in Pierce, South Dakota. In the iris patch, is there any way to get rid of Creeping Jenny without hurting the iris? No, and it's kind of a problem, you know, we, we might think of, you know, iris looks kind of like a grass, and so we might think of iris as a grass, but it's really kind of a broadleaf. I mean, you think about the flower, it's not a typical grass type flower, so it's a broadleaf, so you really can't spray any broadleaf herbicides, you know, in your iris like you could in your lawn. And so, uh, yeah, unfortunately, there's just no good, you know, quick and easy spray type deal. You got to get in there and, and just, uh, you know, weed it out. Um, you know, maybe use some heavy mulch uh, in the spring, four, four inches. The bindweed will still, or the creeping jenny will still probably poke through that, but, you know, you can still, uh, it might slow it down a bit. Uh, you might have to, otherwise, moving the iris patch is about the only other thing you could do and, you know, spray it off with Roundup. So, I, unless there's uh, any other tricks. No, that was the only thing I was going to suggest is if, if they happen to notice the timing is just right to where the bindweed might be up but the iris has not come up yet at all, there might be a chance where they could do a quick shot of Roundup there given the right temperatures for that to work. But uh, you want to make sure your iris hasn't uh, turned green and started to pop through that, that mulch or whatever they have there. Okay, now am, am I wrong? And, My under oh, I'm sorry. And the reason that that would work is Roundup works on contact and it will go down through systemic, so it'll go through the leaves, through the stem, down to the roots to kill that plant out. But there's no residual to it, so in other words, you don't have to worry about something carrying over to cause problems with your iris. It only kills what you spray it on. So if the iris are not there, present to get the contact of that herbicide, then you're all right. Okay. So that, that's the, the tricky timing part of it. So. And perhaps late in the fall might be another good time to be watching for it. As long as the iris, like I said, is completely gone and there's no green tissue, you could sneak in there with a little Roundup in the fall. As long as the bindweed is still green, it'll still be, it'll still take up that Roundup. I was going to ask, my understanding is, or at least my irises, they're, they're pretty tough and it's like if you, they need to be thinned out every so often, could you, you know, pull the irises out, clean out the bed and put them back in and, I mean, that's a lot of labor intensive, but you're not 
Well, you, you could. I mean, that can be pretty labor. It's, it's one of those as far as being able to re remove the iris, but still leaving enough bindweed so that if you treat it, you kill that plant out completely, top growth and the roots. Because okay. if you only kill the top, you don't kill the roots. And you go back in there and replant within a couple of years, the bindweed is going to be back. So you really got to make sure you're going to do a. You, if you take the iris out, you got a one chance to really do a good job, and that, that's uh, what you have to work with. The other thing is, when you take the iris out, you don't want to take any of the bindweed seeds or parts of that plant. You want to make sure you, you get all those off your iris, so you don't replant those back into the patch. Also, once the, the bindweed comes up, so uh, labor intensive. <laughs> There's no simple answer. I was no, fishing no, is, for here. This is one of those. Yeah. There's no good solution. And you know, as Steve mentioned, you know, the the bindweed, especially if it's an established patch, probably has quite an extensive root system, and so it might take a couple years to kill that bindweed. So let's say you did all this work, uh, and and maybe have made a good application, you might find that in a year it's right back again. So. Okay, we'll just change topics. Ta moving on, ta solution. talking about pumpkin plants. They're turning a pale yellow. This is in Sioux Falls. Want to know if they're over, you know, could they be overwatering or what the problem is? The leaves are the same yellow. The plant is blooming all over the plant. It's not looking good. They planted in landscape rock, planted in coffee cans with bottoms of cans cut out, metal cans, plenty of sun, west side of house, surrounded by rock. Cans are set down in the dirt. Um, he has raised pumpkins like this before. Landscape rock has really planted that? I believe so. Okay. And, and that could be, with all the rain we've had, and if there's plastic under that rock, uh, that moisture may be a little more than what that plant really needs, uh, causing it to be yellow. Uh, as well as this, we mentioned earlier, that might be an opportunity too there if they're going to try to really grow pumpkins. and, and um, I don't know if they're doing it for uh, a particular pumpkin for ornamental purposes or they're going to grow a large pumpkin, but uh, they are pretty heavy users of nitrogen and uh, a soil test, if, if they want to be serious about it, might be in order there. But I would say probably moisture is the, the biggest issue there, with the, especially if there's plastic underneath that rock. It just holds that moisture in. Okay. So. All right. A uh, question from Pierre again, Black Hill Spruce. Transplants were two to three feet uh, this spring. in. It has small cones on it now. Would it be okay to remove the cones or should they leave them on? The tree looks healthy. I'd say they could just leave those on. I don't see where that would be any benefit really to remove those at this point. So. Okay, and that's not draining energy off the plant or anything? Well, it energy. probably will be, but I don't know how much you're gonna at this point. minimize that if you do actually remove them. Because if, if they're already there, especially if they've matured those cones, then it, it's already accomplished that goal of filling those out and that energy's already been expended. So. Okay. Question from Mina Lake, uh, up north a ways. Yukon gold potatoes, attached to the plant above the ground are round marble-like clusters, green in color. They need to know what this is and how to get rid of it. Yeah, well, that, that's the one, I think we had a call on that a couple weeks ago too, and that's probably most, most likely would be the seed pod of a potato plant, which is uh, really not functional for the plant. You cannot get really good viable seed out of that. Um, and so I would not worry about it. You can pick them off if you want. Uh, probably the biggest use they could get out of those is, is to bring their neighbor over and say, hey, I just crossed my uh, to potato with a tomato plant, and I'm getting two <laughs> off of one here, but, uh, but uh, that's really not, not the case. So it's just a, a seed pod that is not edible, not to be used, and uh, so they can leave it or pick it off, but it's really the tubers, the potatoes underground is what you want to have. So. Okay, so it's not like a fruit or anything, or, well, or is it? It would be considered a fruit of the plant. A fruit in yeah. your world, yeah, but because, not in mine. Because <laughs> the potatoes themselves really aren't the fruit of the plant. That's what we eat, but the fruit would be up by that flower. The reproductive. Yeah, but it's not a viable thing that we, we harvest off that plant to uh, consume. And so. don't eat it. And right? don't, yeah, don't eat it, okay. actually, yeah. yeah. All no. right. Um, well, uh, real quick question for you about valiant grapes. We've got about 30 seconds. They're eight years old. Clusters of grapes are partially black or all black. What is it and what can be done to treat it? And I'm giving you a real quick. Well, that could be where maybe they weren't quite uh, uh, pollinated correctly and they may be dried up as well as could be some uh, powdery mildew or disease problems. So uh, a couple different things that that could be, but uh, if they want to pick them off, okay. they can. But just oh. go with what they can. Okay, you know. that's all the time we have for this evening. Got to wrap this up. <laughs> um, just to let you know, Garden Line repeats twice each week on South Dakota Public Broadcasting's digital channel three, which is also known as the Create Channel. 
The Encore broadcast can be seen Thursdays at 11 a.m. Central and Saturdays at 4 p.m. Central. Check your local listings to find SDPB Digital Channel 3 where you live. Now, thanks to our panel of experts, John Keekeffer, Brookings County Extension Educator, Steve Monk, Minnehaha County Extension Educator, Mike Mechnig, Extension Weed Specialist, and Professor Casey Jensen, SDSU Wildlife and Fisheries Science Department. Thanks to our phone volunteers, the friends of Garden Line, and thanks to you for watching and calling in. Have a good evening and join us again next Tuesday. This program is funded in part by Swiftel Communications.